Too soon, Dar. Going live. There we go. It's Friday. Oh, I don't need this either. Okay. Hi. Are you there? Hi, Dave. Am I there? Where am I? <laughs> Why? Why am I? We're starting off big here today. Uh, how are you? Happy Friday, Darius. Yeah. No, it's been a good week. But I'm happy we're here. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I uh, I'm starting off the stream with uh, high hopes for covering a lot of content in this one. Uh, <laughs> I saw your to do list and I can't wait. I can't wait. Had, it's gonna be a good week. It's gonna be a good week. We had a we had a lot that we covered last week. It got a little hairy at the end. Uh, no promises this time around that we're not going to run into any similar troubles, but I'm going to do my best here to walk through some kind of complicated stuff and we'll see if we can pull it off um but yeah good week uh i'm starting off on a, a youtube video uh for a reason for a reason i don't know if you saw this other video that was put out i think it was yesterday about like positive affirmations for devops on this on this channel <laughs> this Kazam channel or however you say that i love their videos incredible incredible video um i wanted to start off with that video as a demo to like be able to take a look at the the most watched moments of that video and how like what people are finding the funniest parts of it i think they're like not quite ready yet with the data aggregation and and crunching the numbers on it so i had to go back in time to look at this senior engineer video which is another incredible one uh which does have that and this is like this is kind of what we're talking about today uh, is this feature, which is like, to me, it's life changing. This this overlay on top of the, the bottom of the video. I remember when this came out like mm -hmm. a few years back and looking at that and being like, what is this magic? Like trying to understand here. Uh, it's actually... I, here it's really interesting because it's showing the most replayed section of this video more towards the end. Maybe this is like some of the funnier, the funniest part of the video, or, or there's kind mm -hmm. of like some meme stuff going on here. Um, but in particular, this feature comes really in handy when you're like trying to learn how to do something like fix a leak under the sink and you find the YouTube video of the guy that knows how to fix sink leaks but he talks and talks and talks and it's like 10 minutes video to really just show you that one minute section of the video. You know, the kind of video I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, all right, look, you can actually jump right ahead to six minutes and 33 seconds or whatever and find out the thing and how to do it. That's really where this feature changed my life as a human, let yeah. alone a, an engineer. For um, me, the killer feature was skipping ads like the ad read. Especially oh. like for the folks who don't use chapters, you can just like you see where the spike is and you know, like that's where the content begins. Yeah, there's something to like just knowing where where's the good stuff in the video. And I'm actually kind of surprised it took us this long to like introduce that feature as only really, I think, like a couple years old as soon as that, as far as mm -hmm. I've seen to the front end. Right. There might have been some like. um admin interface where this was exposed to the to the video creator to kind of right. like yeah. let them understand but to the so front end other viewers view. are like dropping off near the end that kind of thing yeah yeah so this was really cool so i i wanted to learn how do you do this first of all like how do you how do you even like know what parts of a video are most interesting um based on the data instead of like what we think is working or what we think is funny and and how could we recreate something like that so I, that's what i thought we would go through today is one idea one approach one method for building something like this out in in our own react code base uh we got a lot to cover so you should probably stop talking about how excited <laughs> i am about this feature you know when this is on youtube the, the the big spike is going to be right after your whole spiel here, right? Totally, totally. We're getting Great to day. like... How do we do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're getting to like the five minutes in mark. So definitely, I'm assuming that the hill is going to start to climb in a little bit here. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So we got to get started here. I got to pull up my notes on this side. Uh, give me a moment. That's this one. 
this one. Okay, so I have I've written about this one before. Uh, so it's on, in the in the history of the Mux blog, captured for eternity, um, is is an approach for this. But there's uh, it's kind of like a step by step way that you can introduce what it is that we're trying to accomplish with some code examples and links out to um, in practice how some of this works. So it's a really great reference for for this stream in particular. But I'm also hoping to cover a little bit more than this blog post covers um, in terms of actually storing the data right in this blog post we're just storing it locally and re-rendering the the heat map data or like the most watched moments of that video but in this particular stream we're going to try to take it a step further and capture that data to a to a data store and then pull it um, and we'll see if we can pull that off but let's just like higher level think about how this kind of thing would work so like if i if i take any video like well, i'm going to go back to this one this is a 2 minute Two minute video, two thirteen, right? So we need to understand, like higher level, when this video is progressing, when when views are coming in on this video, each individual second contains data of whether or not it's been watched or not. Now I've been watched; it's raising its hand or it's or it's kind of waiting its turn, right? And so that I have to show off some of these graphics too that that uh, Mo came up with. Shout out to Mo, our, our designer, uh, on this post which is really just illustrating that what's happening here. So that in this 10 second video, as the playback progresses, we're seeing an array of basically ones and zeros. Like, yes, I've been watched. This particular second has been watched or no, I haven't been watched. It's kind of just like chugging through there and flipping that switch of like, yep, yep, yep. And you see that kind of ties right into the playback there. Is it just ones and zeros or oh, you're about to answer my question. What happens if I rewind and like rewatch a segment? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Not we didn't preplant that, but it did, it did feel that way. <laughs> Dave, uh, I, I promise I read your blog post, but it's been a while. OK, cool. All right. Good. So so what happens if we go back and just replay this video? We want to know that somebody found that part interesting, that somebody wanted or maybe they were confused there. Like there's some reason why they decided to go back and rewatch that part. So there's an opportunity to then change it from that one, which we've already stored for that second, and we say, well, it's actually two. This has been watched twice, this particular second of the video. And we kind of capture all of that information over that, that viewing session. Once that viewing session has ended, typically that's with like going to another page, or reload like loading a different video in place of that the video that existed we want to capture that information somewhere we got to fire it off to to a data store keep it uh keep it safe and then we'll use that information later to kind of like combine it with other playback sessions that have that have come through and uh render the charts that we're looking for render the ultimate data so that's what's happening here in this in this image we have one green viewing session where that 10 second video was watched. You can kind of visually see like it was watched most of the way, but they dropped off here at the end. And then this blue session, watch the beginning, skip this part, watch the rest of it. And collectively between those two sessions, we're seeing this like additive uh, motion where we're, we're adding the positions of these indexes right here. This first one, 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 two, one, zero is one and so on. So then we're ending up with that data. And then we basically have to take this data and transform it into a visual. Um, so I think we're kind of seeing like how this is going to work, uh, at least in, in practice. But I think we should probably also like build the thing <laughs> here, here live. So yeah, I, this feels like pretty straightforward in theory, but I'm guessing stuff gets a little hairy in the details. There's there is a lot to consider here. Um, but the thing that React has always made me so joyful about ever since I learned it uh, was like that this kind of thing is actually possible. It did, like I don't even know before React and these sort of like reactive frameworks came about that how I would achieve something like that. Like back in the jQuery days, I, I literally have no idea. Like you'd have to build out hmm. a cloud. I, I I don't even want to think about like tracking mm -hmm. and displaying that in some way. Um, 
I probably wouldn't do this stream if 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 that was the only technology I had available to me because I just want to feel comfortable. Maybe it's come a long way. I, I realize uh, there's a new jQuery four that's out. So <laughs> maybe I got to look into that, and that could be our new like uploading with jQuery videos. Uh, well, uploading videos with jQuery. Writing that down. Yes. Um, all right. So here I do have a code sandbox that is stood up here, but that's kind of boring to just show you the final code. Um, and it's also missing some stuff here, but I just want to show you like a little bit of this in action of what's happening uh, as it relates to the code here. So if I take this particular video there, I'm just going to reload and get some fresh data. I'll take this video and it's loading up. And as we play through it, I'm capturing the viewing information to second three, second four. And this is a short, pretty short video, 40 seconds. And it's storing that locally that data that's happening and then repopulating it underneath in this part in this one this is a rechart um area chart which you could like take something like this and then lay it over the bottom of the player it's just a matter of styling and positioning it um or these two are kind of like alternative ways you could consider using this data there's a capture of like how many uh, in that array that we were showing in that in that vector array how many of those values are zero um, and how many are, are not zero. So just based on that information, that's where you would render something like this, this 22%. Um, and then here, the this third one, this is a, like a heat map type approach. So for each, let me see if I can bring that up. Um, yeah, this guy. So when you are looping through all of those values. I have them stored here in this PV array. Um, it's basically looking to see like, hey, are you a zero? Are you, are you more than a zero? If you're more, then we want to change it to this indigo value, this indigo color. If it's a zero, then we're just gonna womp womp and, and say it's, it's gray, it's not watched yet. So it kind of like lays all of those out over time. And then what's happening here is choosing a different darker value or maybe a brighter value, I think, um, based off of if that number is even bigger than one, if it's two, if it's three, if it's four, then it's gonna get hotter and hotter and hotter looking as it as it kind of sprays across that the screen size there. So I'll show that too, or like if I went click back and click play, you see we're starting to get some different colors here. And this is just kind of looping through some tailwind classes that are automatically rendering the different shades of that indigo that we have available to us based off of our, our helpers. I'm surprised that works. I don't think you're allowed to do that with Tailwind classes. Oh, I'm allowed. Like, like a template, like template them out. Because Tailwind only generates the CSS if like the class exists as a string somewhere in your code. So you're right. There, if you're to like compile this with Tailwind somewhere, you kind of have to like shim it in a way and fake use the these classes somewhere in your app even if it's just on like a hidden div or right. something just to like force it to all render Generate, i think yeah. in this example i don't remember if i'm just importing the entire library or something just for demonstration purposes but there was I some mean, way works. that um, it was it was working yeah. yeah um but you're right like you you would have to make sure that that string yeah exact. i'd probably use like an object like colors color and then have like an object of like class names corresponding to shade. But I mean, for the sake of this example, I don't mean to derail you too much. This is interesting. Keep going. Uh, you're not derailing. This is this is like the best way that I could figure out of how to kind of easily brighten and darken the values is, is through this. There's probably a lot of different approaches that you can do here, but you can also mm -hmm. see like this hill that we're looking for is starting to form. Right, like this is ultimately, we wouldn't render it from the local data if we were trying to pull it from the server and the storage uh, that's persisted across multiple viewing sessions, but we would get a very similar kind of shape or layout. So um, just wanna walk through that to like kind of visually show, but let's jump into some like fresher code to see this come to life from kind of from nothing. Um, so what I have here is a very, very bare bones Next.js app, of course, got to be Next.js. Uh, but really, it could it doesn't have to be. It could be it could be literally anything. This could be um, your React framework of choice. Uh, for this particular use case, there's nothing really specific about Next.js that we're leaning on here. So uh, just kind of a tool of choice that we go for. 
So here's what I have stood up here. Just one single page. And there's a lot of client stuff happening here. So we're going to see a lot of like the video player itself that I have set up is a, is a client component. Um, we're going to see a lot of, a lot of client code. So we'll make sure to delineate that where, uh, where it's necessary, but here's what's happening. We have a, we have a player that in this player component, there's a, we're using the mux player react library, uh, really not a ton happening here, right? We're starting off pretty slow. We just have the mux player defined. We are passing a playback ID to this component and passing that along to the underlying mux player. So it knows, hey, what this is the video that you want to load. We have some metadata that this this can all get captured in Mux data, which is just nice to kind of learn what videos are being watched and and where are they being watched. You can kind of set those properties too. Um, and this is kind of like the one workaround that we have here is that we'll we're gonna need a reference to this video player because we're this video player as the video is playing back is going to be triggering different events that we care about that we have to listen to and respond to those events. So we need a we need a reference to it. And this is a way with Mux Player right now that we are capturing that reference. You can pass this this function and then capture it in state uh, using this native L, which is kind of the underlying video element from what Mux Player is, is powering. Is there a specific reason you use state rather than a ref here? You know, there was, and I'm trying to think back of like, <laughs> why? I, I, I believe it's because the the hook that we're going to build, we're going to use a custom hook that needs to basically like learn when things are changing in that video player. And when things change within the ref, um, we're not going to get notified of that, right? That's just mm -hmm. going to kind of happen behind the scenes. Yeah. And uh, it'll still be stored somewhere, but we need it to kind of like react to the, the state change itself. Um, right. So I think yeah. that that was the reason why for this particular use case, it was captured in state. This did feel a little bit awkward to me too, but uh, I got yeah. approval from somebody smarter than me, so it's okay. <laughs> so at some point, you're gonna have to store stuff in state so that you can react to that state. If you just stored it in a ref, you couldn't actually like react to it. You couldn't have like effects or like a re-render or something like that. Right, exactly. Because in React, whenever state changes, you re-render. Yes, okay. and I I'll think stay tuned. that captures the majority of it, but let's let's revisit as this kind of <laughs> continues to build out here. Yeah. So, um, there's also just to take a look at some other stuff that's already written. And it's really just to save time. There's nothing too wild that's happening here. This is a recharts map that we're going to be using to represent the data that we capture off the video player. Um, so we have, uh, if like, I can take a look at here at this link, that these components come pre-baked, really great library that allows you to render charts based off of uh, the data that you provide it and give you different toggles and, and properties to be able to turn on and off um, what you're looking to build, basically. So we have this responsive container, an area chart that we're rendering. We're going to pass it data, uh, which is going to come from the array that we'll, we'll build here in a minute. And this is just the kind of colors and, and representation that we're choosing to to build out that chart. But this isn't this really doesn't matter. Like you could choose, you know, any any of your favorite charting libraries, because um, I know you have one. Do you have a favorite charting library, Dave? You know, here's here's one of my favorites right now. Tremor. I think it's Tremor. Oh, this is one of my favorites right now. Um, this one in particular, I started to use, I think, for this example. And there was uh -huh. a little bit more customization that I wanted to do. Yeah. But in That's terms of like charting libraries, it's like as soon as you like dig under the surface, you got to figure out how to customize. And it's like it's a, it's its own like its whole language. Totally. But I'm wondering, yeah. I actually don't even know what this blocks thing is. Maybe there's something here that's like more along the lines yeah. of custom customization. I just remember there being something here when I started building this out. I was like, I need it just a little bit more to be able to mm -hmm. get. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, and Recharts has been around for a long time. My whole previous job was Recharts. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it's kind of like the old workhorse in a way where it's like, yeah. like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep going with what's working. So uh, that was really the reason why I chose Recharge. It seems like it works pretty well, but this one is one that I want to keep my eye on. This Tremor. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For me, tuned. it was always Pancake and Svelte. It was like this little experimental thing that Rich Harris made. Uh, and it's just like the first charting library that works the way my brain works. It just like, all it does is provide like super primitive SVG stuff. And if you know how SVG works, Pancake. you can just, uh, 
yeah, you can. Yeah, that's it. It was just like a little library like that. Interesting. Hasn't been touched in three years, but ah, oh, it just it just worked. I think they even use this on like New York Times and stuff. Oh yeah, some of these like high viz like the data viz mm -hmm. here is really wild. Um, and there's even a like a world where you might reach for like a D three like go to straight to the bare yeah. metal that kind of thing. I think but, yeah, sometimes you just need the primitives. Uh, anyway, charts. Maybe we need <laughs> we a show on charts. Day, I don't know. Yeah, That's, it is a pretty fun. Uh, we could do like video more video charts in the future um anyhow okay so that's what's going on in the heat map not a ton not a ton really to uh super catch your eye but we'll come back to this here in a little bit uh what we need to do is start capturing the data off this player all right so let's let's take a look at that uh we got the player my cool tracker app set up videos playing back so the next step here is we need to build out that hook uh, that's going to capture the data that we are pulling off of the player. And then once we have the data and the viewing session is complete, which I think we could probably mock here um, instead of having to close the window all the time and reopen it, we can sort of like force that data off to the server and capture it. Um, so let's, let's take a look at that now. So I'm going to just build a, a new file here, call it use playback vector. Um, I was choosing JavaScript only for this just because I didn't want to debug TypeScript live. <laughs> that sounds kind of not so fun. So intimidating. Uh, probably yeah. would go TypeScript for this, but you know, mm -hmm. we'll keep it simple here. Um, all right, so we have to we have to get going here. So at the if I go back to this blog post here, this kind of show you like just get us started here. Um, we need a hook. We need a hook, and a hook is what I mean. This, I feel like the teacher right now of like prompting the question to the audience. Uh, what's a what's a hook, Dar? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, I could tell you when I would use a hook. It's like when I want to respond to state in some way or like kind of just abstract some reacty functionality away. I like response to the react lifecycle somehow. You've revealed a huge hole in my knowledge. I, feel I like literally I don't, don't know definition. how to describe it. Like, I, I feel like I know when to reach for a, a, some kind of custom hook, especially when I want to encapsulate like logic that is all related to uh, the functionality of something specific. And I can just like tuck it away somewhere and pull it in when I need to. Um, but I don't know if that's like the official definition. Uh, that's what I'm going to go with for my definition anyway. Um, so, a, a, but a hook in general, really, in this case, it's just a function. Like, there's nothing super special about what's happening within this hook, at least not yet. It's going to be very special uh, soon. But at the moment, we are just, we have a, a function. It's going to accept our video element, which we're capturing way back over here. And uh, it needs to, it needs to do something, right? So I'm going to, we're actually going to be using a lot of React stuff here. Start with the use state. Use callback is going to allow us to like memoize and and, and save a specific version of a function, um, and just to kind of save some keystrokes here. I'm going to go kind of line by line as we walk through this here. So we're going to have a piece of state that's just an array uh, that's going to be the, our playback vector, which is really like what we're calling that that array of data. Um, the zeros and, we and ones from earlier zeros and ones just an array yeah. of zeros and ones that's all it's really all programming <laughs> man i'm just gonna send me spinning um existential my, my job is just like why why do i isn't there isn't there something greater to it um i don't know but anyway i'm gonna block that thought from my brain and uh let's go to this next section here there's there's slice up the duration of the video so each second of the playback can be accounted for individually so what does that mean well, we need to know when that video is loaded, it comes in basically like how long is it um, and take that length and turn it into a playback vector, a, a vector, uh, basically an array that has a value of zero in this case for each individual second that exists within the uh, video. Does that make sense? The video is 100 seconds long. You got 100 zeros. That's it. That's all there is to it. So what we have here is some additional code that will, I don't know. I don't really didn't intend to copy paste this entire thing, but we'll see. We, we don't have, for it. we don't actually, 
yeah, there's no proof. There's no proof on that one. There. We don't actually have to do. Uh, let's see. This approach. This approach is really meant for um, being able to possibly work with live streams as well. Um, but we're not Whoa. doing that in this. So I'm gonna like just delete some of this. What's seekable? Basically, that's like what's currently loaded in the video player. Um, which, if you don't know the duration of a live stream like this one you can only really track what you currently have. So player.seekable will give you uh, information about the current length of what's loaded in that video player. We don't really need that right now. We know we know the actual length, so we can go straight to the duration. Um, so I'm just gonna go here. And what is this doing? So we just have a new function. It's wrapped in this use callback that only changes when the player itself does that we'll be passing uh, to this particular function. And as this comes in, we basically have to just like safety, make sure, hey, we have a player at all. Um, and if we don't, let's not try to do anything fancy here because that would be bad news if we try to use something that doesn't exist yet. Um, and then zero fill it. So we're taking the duration of the video that's loaded in the player, going to round up just in case there is uh, anything that's not perfectly, you know, a, a round number. Uh, we want to just get that up to the next second that might be available or that would like sort of overlap into. And then we're creating that vector with just this little method here. And so it just says, hey, create a new array of this length of the video and fill it with zeros and set it. So that's all we're doing here. So we have a, this original starting point of zeros for the video that's been loaded. And we can kind of verify that here in a minute too. But I'm gonna keep rolling on through um, so here's where some of the interesting stuff is happening is the actual, how do we update this? How do we listen to the player, um, and the events that are coming off of that player and keep track of what's happening there? You following me? Uh, I'm following. How do we update that? I don't know. I was kind of hoping you would tell me. I was hoping you would tell me. All right, I'll tell you. Um, all right. So we have to copy this bring this over to we'll walk through this part as well so we have we're going to use a ref here and this is actually the kind of the opposite for the reasoning that we were describing before um we actually don't want to have too many notifications going to to the state setter all the time that would make too many changes happening here that we don't necessarily care about when we are playing back a video we're, we're going to be listening to an event that fires a couple of times a second. Um, it's not, uh, It's. I don't think it's super, super predictable. It ends up using to be like three to four times a second or something like that. Um, but we can't, if we were gonna be updating the state, there'd be a lot of things changing as a result of those updates. And we don't actually care too much about how often those are firing. So we're gonna use a ref instead to determine what was the last second that we just recorded rather than keeping that information in state. So we'll see more about that here too in a little bit, but we have this update playback vector function that we'll be using. And same thing that's happening here. If the video player, which probably also double check that the player exists. So I can copy this guy. If the player is paused, we don't need to do anything. Uh, there's no updates happening to this data array. If there's no playback happening. Um, but if, it, if there is, then we need to get some information about where the playback head currently is, the playhead. So we have uh, this approach here. There's a current time property on the player that's coming in. And we're going to access that. We're going to round that down to, hey, this is, if, if we're at like 1.2 seconds, we're still kind of like on that first second here. And then we're going to capture that playback vector by using these, this React state setter. So here, here's what's going on in this kind of wild looking uh, setter here. When you pass this callback function, it's going to get what's currently stored in state, right? So there's uh, a bunch of zeros really at this point uh, that it's the length of the, the video. And we're going to just make a, make a copy of that. So we don't make any sort of mutations to what's currently within state, we just need the current value here. And then we're just checking to see like, hey, if in this array, 
at the current second that we are that we care about that's being watched right now if it's equal to zero then we should instead set it to one and we'll be updating it with that value if instead uh what's happening here if the current second does not equal the current second if the current last second recorded because remember this is happening a couple times per second so we don't always want to update it every single time a new change comes in because we could potentially be updating the same second uh multiple times even though it's only been watched once right at that particular time so that's what's happening here it's kind of like a double check did we already update this particular second for this playback if we did, then don't do anything. If not, then we do need to increment it if it's not the current second, because then that would mean like maybe somebody went back to that second and bumped it back up. How was that explanation? Sounded kind of wild. I'm trusting you on this, but I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can try to put this in my own words. If, if the, um, so, so we're looking at a value in in the playback vector. We've got like, I don't know, zero, zero, zero. First second, 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 third second. Let's say the, the viewer is watching the very first second of the video. So this code will say if we're on second zero and that value is zero, then we're going to set it to one. That's what this first block does. It goes from zero to one. And the second block here, if... Okay, so let's say the next time this call back gets called, um, the last second recorded is going to be zero. And let's say current second is zero. So this wouldn't happen either. Yeah, so let's we say wouldn't this want gets called twice happen. in a row for zero. So it just stays like that. Yep. And then once we go to second one, then we update this to one, one, one. And then let's say the person rewinds to the first second. It's no longer the previous second recorded and it's no longer this block. So this code would fire here and that would update to two. Okay. I think I'm getting it. This this lets you this lets you change things from zero to one, one to two, two to three, but it's not going to do that if the same second fires multiple times in a row. So if the event fires a couple times within the zeroth second or the first second. That's right. Yeah, it's trying to do Ooh. its best at like that was pretty good. Uh it's trying to do its best at like maintaining the integrity of the playback session here. There might yeah, be like yeah. some this ability to refactor this a little bit to make just like a plus plus sort of situation. However, um, to try to like spell out the conditions here as clearly as possible might even be better, at least for somebody like me. Like I like to know mm -hmm. what's happening in each particular condition, even if it means like whatever we write like two more lines of code or whatever. So uh, that's what's happening. Yeah, that's what's happening there. That was a deep and humbling lesson for me when I actually got into software, like when I got out of school and actually spent a couple of years. It was like I used to be all about writing that like really clever one liner with like the interesting ternaries and conditions and stuff. And then after a while, I realized like just write the 10 lines of code like sure, it's not as clever, but at least like it's legible. If I get, you know, murdered by a velociraptor, the person who replaces me at least is going to get what I wrote. I think the person that would follow you would have more questions about the velociraptor, <laughs> the velociraptor. Uh, uh, but it's possible that they would at least understand what you wrote the code as well yeah, at least i would be concerned if i knew that like if there was an update in slack that's like guys we got news about dar don't know how this happened uh, <laughs> uh, no i mean i've heard generation. it called the bus factor like if i get hit by a bus but i i don't remember who it was somebody online maybe somebody i worked with said like that's too dark and started calling it the velociraptor yeah factor. And i kind of like that I do like that too. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep that in the memory bank. Uh, let's cruise on here. So we have we have a Velociraptor theme. Please stay AC for this for this particular stream graphics. Uh, we <laughs> have a playback vector uh, effect here that's happening as well. So I'm gonna copy that. Man, this blog is so nice that you could just click the copy button. Who built that? Wow. Um, they must be really good at programming. Probably totally. really clever code. So what's happening here? So use effect is basically going to run this is a little bit more about react primitives i, I almost don't want to try to explain use effect uh because i <laughs> feel like i'll get it wrong too uh but what's ideally happening here is that it's only going to run when its dependencies change right so if something ab about the update playback vector function that we wrote up here changes or if the player changes 
then we need to rerun uh, this. But ideally, we're not going to have a ton of changes in this. And um, if the player, like if the player loads a different video, then of course we need to remove an event listener so it's not listening to uh, the same information that it was before. And that's kind of what this is doing. So when the player comes in, we're going to add an event listener to the time update event. And that's what a, a video player will fire as the video is progressing, as it's playing back, because there's a time update event. And when that event fires, we need to call this function, this update playback fun this update playback vector function. Um, and then, of course, when this uh, effect stops or needs to be rerun, then we need to remove that event listener and clean clean things up too. So uh, this is kind of like wiring up the playback itself to the function that we need to run that handles the the data setting. How's that? Use effect. I'm I'm following it so far. There's no Use effect, issue. You're attaching the event listener to the player, and if the player changes, you attach the event listener to a different player. Nailed it. Okay, so recording, right? So like once we have this information captured somewhere, and we could probably like wire this up to the actual player here in a second too to make sure, um, to make sure it's working. So like, what well, I would probably grab this this guy here. So let's go back to the player. I'll import our hook that we're writing. Uh, use playback vector. I think it's a default export. And we're going to pass it that video element here. So that's what's going to kind of register or make this like hook aware of the video that exists outside of uh, its own file contents, right? So let's save. Save the playback vector, save the player. And looks like we're getting some error here. It'll be using that Is it in a not little a bit. Export. Oh, I, I didn't export it as a default. I'll do it. You know what? All right. Maybe there's a reason I didn't do that. So let's undo. Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. We'll find out. All right, player's not defined, so we're going to get there. Let's keep chugging. Uh, recording the playback vector. So here's basically the next step of that. We need a function that at some point will fire this information off to a server somewhere and store it, save it. Um, and it will basically trigger, like we, we talked about this a little bit before, but like there are times, and I, I don't think I need to really wire these up right now, we can maybe mock this, but there are different events that you might care about where this you're going to consider this viewing session over, right? If they close the window, if they load a different video in. And so on those events would be a really great time to then record the playback vector uh, and store that off onto your server. So this is like another way that you can potentially approach that. There's here's just, just some basic events, but you might care about other events you might care like if the video player is scrolled off screen like you could listen to that particular event and then fire off the, the playback vector um in this case yeah we'll maybe try to trigger this manually but in when we record that playback vector we're gonna um have this type off of the at least for the these particular events that are coming in we'll have a type and be able to determine if the the type itself of this event is emptied that's basically saying like hey this video player is unloading the current video and is going to load something else so we can reset we can know that we need to basically clear out what uh, information we currently have stored in state and reset it to to blank right and this here is just a little check that says like hey let's just sanity check to make sure that uh we have data to send here and if so then we can build the logic out to send it off to the server. Cool. So uh, what else are we missing here? So we have, I think I have two different names for what I'm called, but I've been calling video. Mm, yeah, L player, player, player and video L. Yeah, so I think that's what's going on here too. Change this name up here to player. And did I use that anywhere else? Video L? No, I'm good. Okay. 
All right, so now we're loading just fine. And we should be able to see, uh, well, we're not returning anything just yet either. So we need to make sure at the bottom of this hook, if I go back to the player, we're hoping that uh, as a result of the calling this function, we're going to get that array. We're going to get that playback vector that's going to have all the values that we care about. So we need to return that from this particular hook. Um, and that information is stored up here in state. So I should be able to go here at the bottom and say return playback vector. Uh, okay. Determine, record, and we need to do the updating as well too. Oh, we have the updating already. Okay, cool. So we have, um, just console log this out. Boom. Empty array. And then when the hook finds out how long the video is, it should initialize as zeros. That's right. So where what are we missing here? There's something that we hadn't wired up. When does before. update playback vector get called? It gets called on a time update. Maybe time update hasn't run yet. Player. The, the... Well, we should it... also have like, oh, the determine is not getting called. So where did I call the determine playback vector? Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see. That's got to be an effect as well, I think. Let's see. So determine... when the player. Yeah, there, there it is. Go. Loaded okay. metadata. So here's the piece. Did we not put this in here? I might have just completely skipped that part. OK, so let's do here. Uh, you're right. And it's another effect. So what's happening here is very similar to what we were describing before. And the event that we care about is this loaded metadata event, which comes right off of the video player. It will basically let us know, like, hey, we have some information about the video uh, that you currently have loaded. What do you want to do with it? And we're going to call determine playback vector with that information. So let's go ahead and save that. Go back to my cool tracker app and look. There it is. Now we're getting what we're what we're hoping for there. So 41 zeros. So 41 second video. Uh, nice. I sure I sure hope uh, 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 we're at the end oh. there. OK, so um, look what's happening monster. here too. as yeah, as I'm playing back, we're starting to get some actual information that should be right in line with where we currently are in this video. All right, so we're building out, it's truly, it's a singular array. That's all it is, is an array of ones and zeros that's capturing what's happening on our video. And if I go back to the beginning and say like, oh my gosh, the beginning of this video is hilarious. Play. Look at that water. Some, we're starting, <laughs> is it water? It's kind of like water, mostly water, like 90% water, percent cranberry juice strawberry juice anyway um we do have some additional values here that's what we were looking for okay so now we got 15 minutes left to do something with this data where do you sync the playback factor what do we do so all right so this is kind of where the blog post stops like it, it says like hey you're smart <laughs> good luck <laughs> <laughs> you you can figure out what to do with this and I think we decided to do that. Maybe I was tired of writing um, or truly like there are so many ways that you can store data, right? But in today's stream, we are going to make a decision and I'm going to use a, a cool little product called Titanbird. Um, I've been exploring this just for funsies in my free time. Uh, maybe we'll do some more streams in the future with Tinybird, uh, but really interesting way to take your data and convert that to um, an API that allows you to access it. And uh, this is where we're going to store it for the stream. So it's one example. This is not the, uh, I should put like 100 asterisks. This is not the only way to do this. There are um, another way that I know very viably is possible is through uh, my BigQuery. They have a streaming insert. Um, Let's go here real quick so we can like look at the node the way that you would import rows into BigQuery using a node 
or Java. This might be service. It might require server side. I'm not sure. So you'd have to like set this up at an API endpoint that could run on the on the server. Um, but it would insert it into your BigQuery table. You could do something similar that way. But I digress. Well, we're gonna go all the way here. Tiny Bird. Uh, here's the Tiny Bird admin. I uh, am just really kind of playing around. I don't know the majority of what's happening in here, but what's happening, at least for this particular example, we have a data source, which is kind of our table in a way. I have this events example table, and there's only two columns that we care about. There's the playback ID, because we need to know like, hey, I don't want to show the playback vector or the playback information for uh, playback ID uh, XYZ if the video that's being loaded is video ABC, that would be bad news, right? So we need to understand like what information do we need to load? Um, and then what are the values that we have for that for that particular playback ID? So this is kind of what was built out for the schema here. Very easy to build this out, I must say. Uh, there was just a matter of, I actually don't even think I defined the schema. I think I did an insert. Um, and he just figured it out based off the properties of the object you inserted? Yeah, so nice. let, let's look here. This, this is in the capture util that I built out. It's just a HTTP request using fetch, post request, and it's expecting that you have a playback ID and a playback vector value. And then this, I, yeah, I would recommend checking the docs because I'm not sure. Exactly. This looks like something you would probably generate and not certainly not store it uh, right in your application. I'm not sure if this right. is like Right, you'll probably want that friendly. as like an environment variable or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if this is needs to happen in this. In this case, we're just gonna do it straight off of the um, off the browser. But this, you might want to double check and like see if you uh, need to proxy something like this through your own API and then send it. I'm not entirely sure, but we're just gonna send it straight from the browser. Um, yeah, I feel like if you send that to the browser, then just like any old user is gonna be able to post stuff to your database and start posting all that's sorts true of but that's that's stuff, also yeah. true for a lot of different event systems like that mm -hmm. you could really kind of like mock events happening and the the important thing to re recall here at least for this use case is it's kind of less about i mean your data integrity matters but it's more about like a temperature of like are people mm -hmm. watching this video? And if so, is like, is it this part of the video? Is it like somewhere over here? It's less about being exact because it, on, on any kind of client side tracking, there's going to be times where data gets missed. Uh, it's either blocked. There's an error with the HTTP request. There are going to be moments where it's just not, it's not captured. So I wouldn't rely on any sort of like client side tracking for the integrity. It's more mm -hmm. like, hey, is my body temperature 98 or do I have a fever of like 104? Like that's kind of the information I care about care about here right uh, but either way i would double check to see if the, if this is like actually meant to be on the client um we're gonna use it on the client because yolo we also have this pipe right so the pipe in this case is kind of the query that we care about to like take this data from the server and group it all together in the in, in the way that we need it to use it on the front end so I have this, this is another huge asterisk. This works for this example. I don't know if this is the best way to write this kind of query. Uh, I may have used some uh, open AI APIs to assist with a query like this because I certainly am not a data, uh, big data expert, like some of our uh, local experts at Mux. But in this case, this seems to be working pretty well um, for taking our demo data that we have ABC and then doing that aggregation, right? So we have two, 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 a bunch of zeros. So that's working as expected. So it's kind of interesting here within tiny bird was I, I could just create an API API endpoint for this particular query result. And it just like, <laughs> well, throws that a ton so of confetti, good. which is, I love that. Super important, but also just like, we have an R dashboard. You know what? I'm taking a note. Could could you take a note on that? <laughs> Let me call up the dashboard team. We got to throw that into our feedback tracker. Um, oh, shoot. I'm working on that now. We'll add that to the docs. Amazing. Okay, perfect. So, Dar, we learned one thing today, and it's that we need more confetti. Confetti. I said it wrong when I tried Happy this. Happy Friday, Dave. <laughs> Here we go. So, there's, uh, look at this, sample usage. I could literally, more of my favorite copy paste here. They have an endpoint, right? That I could just like query this endpoint. I can actually pass a variable 
to this particular query um, and get this data right into my application. So I'm going to copy this. It's awesome. And I'm going to go over to my page. Again, this is kind of similar. Like I don't really know if, that this is supposed to happen on the client. And here we're in a server component, right? So I need to convert that right, to async. happening on the server. Yeah. This is all happening on the server. So this is fine. This will probably be like in a environment variable somewhere. Um, You're running fetch, just, so that's going to get cached. So you probably got to tell next year to not cache that. But that's production oh, yeah. stuff. This will work in dev mode. All right. So let's see here. And we're looking here at the bottom in the console that it already reloaded and ran that query. And it's getting that demo data nice. into the, the summed vectors um property here so that's pretty sweet like the, the way that you could just build it like understood my schema it allowed me to write this wild query and then uh stand up an api and i did all that like <laughs> we had 15 minutes left and i'm like dave <laughs> yeah i'm gonna I, make it i, I know <laughs> it's I, been I, like five minutes it's pretty amazing so the the thing that here's what's standing out that we need to like connect the dots here right like we need to have a way that would basically take this playback vector, stuff it into an HTTP request to capture it, and then recall it for that particular playback ID so we can render it into the, the chart. Uh, does that make sense? I think it does. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Uh, you're right, we only got eight minutes. We probably could do something just like, uh, let's go back to the page. And maybe we have a button in this case. Again, you would probably do this with like an event, like an unload event, or maybe an unload. There's even like a beacon. Send beacon is one where you could like fire and forget. Yeah, didn't you have like in the hook, like when the video like on the player unload and stuff like that? There is, but I didn't I didn't pull it in for this example just because like we'll oh, be closing see. the window and yeah, really yeah, yeah, like reload or whatever. But let's just say like our event in this case is going to be like a button save. And click is save. Sure. And in production, you'd probably want to do this automatically somehow. Yes, absolutely. So we have, uh, oh, this is going to need to be a client component, yeah? Uh, Yeah. To respond to a button click, yeah, totally. OK, so I can do it with form we'll do with it. server action. No, no. Let's, That's going to take you. Maybe I do it here if I can. Let's wrap that. OK, so we're seeing that we could probably get a refactor already, but and let's do it. AG blue. Oh, it's looks be so good. Mm -hmm. OK, on click, we're going to save and save. So we needed just a quick save. Here's Copilot help me out, big dog. All right. And we can import our util. Um, is that a default export? Yep. Import capture, capture, save. And then there's also probably like, love this. Um, there's also probably some like use callback type situation here that would be helpful too but i think we could mm -hmm. probably just do this in the meantime yeah you'd have to have like loading states and stuff and yes this is where dar comes in as the hero so if we were to click this button ideally what's happening here is it's going to await the capture function that we've defined over in this file which is going to post off to our endpoint um and store the events endpoint and see what i have the events example which is kind of the table name that we set up in, in TinyBird. And we are passing the playback ID and the playback vector as the uh, as a params here. So player, where'd I go? Here, save playback vector. Let's see. Uh, this is kind of untested, so let's find out. Successful. Wow. So we click that, the capture. We logged it here. That's why we're seeing that in the console. If I go back to TinyBird, let's look at the data sources. There it is. Oh, perfect. OK, cool. So let's like, could I reload? Hit play. Let me rack up a view over here too. I think I have access to your environment. Okay, we got some wild stuff happening here. Let's save. Successful, right? Here comes another one. 
And those are all my random clicks that are happening here. So then we have, uh, we'll see if Dars comes through. Hitting save. All right, it probably saved. There you go. Sweet. So now we're looking over at our query, right? So this is taking that uh, variable. This is kind of just the special syntax. I think they use ClickHouse under the hood, but maybe it's like got some sugar on top to do stuff like this, which is kind of checking the API endpoint uh, for, or the request for the variable that's coming in and maybe fall back to ABC if they don't have anything. Um, and this gets, Pop, this populates the query. This makes sure that we get the results that we're looking for. So um, we have our API endpoint. There's also probably some more to do here for like optimizing not only this query, but like I think they called it like a, um, oh gosh, I forget. It's like a roll up basically, like ca cache, pre cache the results of these kinds of queries. So you don't have to compute them on demand. You instead compute them, I think, like on insert. Um, so when you make the actual call to the API, it'll already know the information that you're looking for based off of that, that cached call, that roll up. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we got this, we already copied that. So if I reload here, we should be getting only the information for the playback ID, uh, but we need to change ABC as the param to playback ID. So this is actually using the playback ID we've defined here. You might pull this playback ID from the route that you're currently on in the page in Next.js or the query parameter on the page. Um, that'll probably differ based off of your your particular setup. Summit vectors, there it is. Uh, and there we go. Look, so we're seeing like the math coming in here that this is the playback ID we care about, and those are the vector different data than what we were seeing before. So all there is to it from here uh, in three in three more minutes is <laughs> importing the heat map. Yeah, the stuff we started out with. We started out with. We could put it here, heat map. Uh, and then what the heat map accepts is I think called PV. And what we actually need off of the return value is the array here. So the, where is that located? That's in, we'll see. Result data, see TypeScript. TypeScript would be a big fan here, big friend of mine. <laughs> uh, Console see. log will have to do. Let's see what happens here. There it is, some vectors. OK, so data, uh, that's going to be a 0 to access the array, and summed vectors. Let's go. OK, does that give us what we're looking for? There it yeah. is. OK. Const PV equals. Some vectors. Let's pass it here. PP. Ah. Oh, oh, there it is. Looks like people are really dropping off after the start of the video, Dave. I look. It's I didn't make the video after the water saying, starts pouring. I just, thought it was a pretty good video. It only gets better. I think the viewers are missing out. But we should really see. Like, if I reload this, this is live. That's awesome. This is live data now. So if we play this, and I go to the end, I say, you know what? This is the end's the best part. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we have to save it manually here, but again, you would fire that automatically normally. And then I'm going to reload because uh, that information isn't going to auto update. But now we have some information, some data at the end mm -hmm. here. So there we have it, folks. That's awesome. And literally 15 seconds left. Uh, we pulled off a, a lot. Yeah, there's a lot oh, yeah. of explaining here, uh, a lot of sanity checking, but all this is looking like something you could actually take to take to production, to me anyway. Um, mm -hmm. It's only one way to do it. And again, it, de it depends on what the integrity of your data, what your requirements looks like. But for me, in our use case, for this example anyway, pretty cool way to be able to see what's happened in your videos. What do you think, Dar? Any, any questions from your side that were outstanding for what we covered?
today. No, I'm a front end dev. I'm allergic to back end. Like anytime a database comes up, just like literal ugh. And like I just love how I'm like we're not sponsored to say this or anything, but like it felt like Tiny Bird made it super easy. That's I, what I, I liked about my discovery with them too. Is like it just yeah. seemed like a very simple way to, as a front end engineer as well, to kind of understand the whole process um, and take that information that we care about that we need and convert it to an API call, which I'm can do sleeping, like make that request and get the information that we need without like, again, there's like a little bit of an asterisk there with that query. And I would probably like, we have big, big data James internally that I might hit up to like, tell me why this is a terrible query, but um, for our particular use cases seem to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. All right, we're running long here. Any last words, final thoughts, or weekend plans? Good stuff. I'm going to go, like, I'm taking off to go see Dune 2. Mm, Dune 2, yeah. Lost in New York. Glad you didn't go over. <laughs> All right, very good. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the kind words, Zar, and we'll see you, buddy. Your stream was pretty good, too, Dave. Yeah. I enjoyed uh, it. I, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. All right, very cool. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you next time, folks. Bye.